Good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and I'm so excited to welcome you to tonight's Times Talks. We're live here in New York, and we're live around the world on the web at New York Times Facebook and timestalks.com. Thank you for joining us and continuing the Times Talks conversation on social media. Tonight, we are thrilled to present the stars and the creative team behind one of the most highly anticipated new musicals opening on Broadway this fall. Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812. The two stars are both making their Broadway debuts in The Great Comet. One is a Grammy award-winning singer, songwriter, and actor who has entertained us with his multi-platinum albums, electrifying performances, and comedic film and television roles. The other is an accomplished actress with extensive experience on stage in the US and London and on screen in the hit series on television called Unreal. Joining them are the two creative collaborators behind the new musical. The Obie Award-winning writer who wrote the book, music, and lyrics for The Great Comet, his 11th musical. And the director, the Obie Award-winning writer and director, who's also the artistic director of the experimental ensemble called The Team. You'll hear much more about them and the show in just a moment from our moderator. A theater reporter for the New York Times, he writes about the business and the art of Broadway. The latest productions, the biggest stars, and the drama on stage and behind the scenes. Please join me in welcoming New York Times theater reporter, Michael Paulson, and our very special guests, Rachel Chavkin, Josh Groban, Danae Benton, and Dave Malloy. Thanks for being here, and thanks to all of you who are watching online. So I want to start by asking you a little about your relationship to this material, just so I know where we are. How many of you have seen a production of this show before? Ooh. All right. How, how many of you have read War and Peace? <laughs> <coughs> I think that, that's yeah, the yeah, yeah. one line. Wow. Bravo. All right, and how many of you own a recording by Josh Groban? <laughs> All right, <laughs> so there we are. There we are. Well, we're going to talk a little about Josh, but first we're going to talk a little about the show. I had no idea all the three of those things overlapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Here we go. Yeah. All right, so Dave, I want to start with you, uh, Hi. where the show begins. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you are working uh, as a piano player on a cruise. Yes. You are reading War and Peace, and something about it says to you, musical. <laughs> it's totally true. So yeah. obviously that's not most people's experience on First Encounter with Tolstoy. Tell us, like, yeah. what, what about you I, saying? I should say one, one thing about it is I, I was in a very particular headspace while working as a a cruise ship piano player. I had, I had a girlfriend on land, and this was the way that we were kind of keeping together as we were reading books together, and we were reading giant, giant books because I had so much time, and I, and I didn't really fit in socially on the cruise ship. I felt a bit of a, of, of a misfit and an outcast, so I just basically hid in books the whole time. And uh, so this one Pierre, uh, character, Pierre, in the novel really, really spoke to me because he's kind of going through this existential crisis at the time, and, and I was too. And uh, yeah, and then this one particular section of the book, I hit this 70-page section of the book, and I think I read it like all in one sitting because this one section was just so exhilarating. And I literally got to the end of that section, and there were tears strolling down my face, and I totally had the thought, this would be a perfect musical. 
just, it was so clear. I, can't, I couldn't believe that no one had done it already. Yeah. But so you're a reader. You encounter lots of fiction. How do you know which ones uh, lend themselves to musicalization? I, I think what was about this particular section was that um, a lot of like classical musicals will have like kind of the, the A couple and the B couples. You know, there's there's Nathan Detroit and then there's Sky Masterson. So there's kind right. of the, the two couples. Uh, and this show has that as well. So there's Natasha and Anatole. They're kind of the, the A couple, and they're like where the most of the dramatic narrative action of the show is. But then the second couple is like Pierre and and God, or like Pierre and <laughs> Nina, or like Pierre and himself. Pierre and, himself, yeah. and I loved it how there was like this yeah. really this peculiar take on it, and you kind of follow these two stories in parallel, and they only intersect at the very, very end. And I thought it was just such an amazing way to tell this like thrilling narrative romance, but at the same time tell this like very introspective and, and uh, internal kind of philosophical story. But you know, one kind of feeds off of the other. Right. Yeah. So that was the the perfect marriage, and then they intersect just at this tiny moment at the very end in the most thrilling way. Right. So Rachel, you are a director. Yeah. You've been working mm -hmm. sort of in the world of crazy ideas. Yeah. And you're friends with Dave. Yeah. So, so yeah, we met like in the downtown experimental scene. Uh, Dave is part of an ensemble, and I uh, run an ensemble as well. And uh, we cross paths that way, and I fell in love with his music. So he says to you, I have this idea, War and Peace, the musical. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> what is going through your head as you try to figure out whether to like laugh this off or engage with it in some serious way? Oh, it was immediate engagement, definitely. I mean, we were, so we began talking about it when we were together on a gig at Bassar College, which was actually the first time we ever worked together. And it was this very nice, low pressure way to meet. Um, and, uh, and we were strolling across the green and we were just talking about dream projects. And he said, well, there's this sliver etc. Um, and I w w was like, oh, I got to reread that book. And I went to the bookstore and I got it. And then, and then when we started developing it with Ars Nova, it was, I mean, it just made sense. Mm -hmm. And it's as crazy as Les Mis is crazy and as um, uh, so many other, yeah, so many other ideas that have hit I mean, Les Mis way. was always for me the touchstone. Yeah. Like, that is the show that, that proves that this you know, giant historical novel, of course that makes a perfect musical. Like it's been tested, so yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. right, in the same theater as it in turns out. In the same yeah. theater, yeah. beautifully um, enough, yeah. Okay, so the show is done at Ars Nova, which is this tiny uh, off-Broadway theater, and then it's a success, so it's, uh, reproduced in tents, first in the Meatpacking <laughs> District and then in Midtown. And Josh, this is where you catch up with it. That's right. And in Midtown, next to the Imperial. Next to the Imperial. Yeah. yeah, right next to right. the parking lot. Yeah, so I saw it uh, downtown, the casino. So first, I've always been curious, like, how you wind up there. You're traveling like crazy. You have an international recording career. Presumably, your ability to see theater in New York is somewhat limited. How do you even hear about this sort of small, weird show and, like, what gets you in there? Well, I'm very lucky that um, at that time I was spending a lot more time in New York. And I, um, you know, I always try to have my ear to the ground with friends that I know and trust and are, are in the theater community and in the arts world to kind of point me in the direction of things that are maybe off the beaten track that um, I might enjoy um, more than the stuff that's, you know, that's obviously kind of a big smash thing or whatever. So um, that said, Great Comet was starting to get an amazing buzz and an amazing word of mouth downtown. So it wasn't just my theater friends that were talking about it. It was I would hear I would just hear people murmuring about it at, at, during certain places. So um, so I just I was just curious. I was so curious because um, I I knew that they were doing it based on this portion of War and Peace, and so of course like that piqued my interest. But then the person that had that had told me I needed to go see it basically said. I'm going to tell you there's, there's part of it, it's, it's about part of War and Peace, but, but go in really not knowing much else. Go in and just be open-hearted and open-minded and experience this show. And that's what I did. I went in and I had a couple glasses of vodka and I sat, <laughs> and I sat, more, three or four. And, um, and I sat back and just from the first accordion note of the show, just thinking, okay, well, what's, what am I in for here? And it was, um, it was it was one of the, it was one of those things where I walked out thinking, well, first of all, this was music that um, was up up there with some of the great shows that I had ever seen, 
but from a, a, an experience standpoint of just what I, the buzz that I felt in the room, the energy that I felt around me, from the people that were around me, from the other actors that were so close to me, um, was, was also something that I'd never, never really felt and experienced before in the theater. And so um, I walked out of it just thinking, well, this is great. This is something that I think the theater community can, can draw from and is great for. And I just wound up, I took a picture with the cast. Yeah, okay, that picture is on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> and, I was, and many of those cast members are now are in this production. So many of the cast members that I'm working with have been doing it since the workshop. So, um, you know, I'm, I didn't have a beard then, you know, and I, so I'm standing there with, with, hey, love this show. Everybody should go see it. And the great comment Twitter account at that time said, great to have you in our family tonight, Josh. Thanks for coming, you know. Right. And um, when I look back on the, many years ago and I think about, you know, what's happened and how, how the show has, um, has continued to grow and evolve and has now been given this opportunity that has, it has long deserved. Um, it's thrilling as a fan and, um, and especially as somebody who's now honored to be part of that family. Right. So, Danae, as I understand it, you grew up, your introduction or your first enthusiasm was for Wicked. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basic. So, I loved it. No. Every second. <laughs> Awesome. And <laughs> you never had a chance to see this show, and you came to an audition. Yes, my, my journey was far more traditional. Um, they were auditioning for the role of Natasha, and um, I remember when I first got the email, I was like, okay, a Russian countess. I don't know if I'm who they're looking for. And I heard no one else, and I was like, but oh my God, I love her so much. And I like, mm -hmm just connected with that song and with her vitality for just sort of understanding this extra layer of the divinity in life. Mm. And um, when I went in for it, I had gone in for Rachel and Dave once before and I just like really loved that experience, which loving an audition experience is rare. <laughs> and, um, and so when this one came around, I just sort of was like, well, whether or not I am the person they envisioned, I love her, so I'm going to just bring my heart. And then the audition process went along, and I got cast at ART. Right. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that, that first audition, because it's so interesting. I, I hear this sometimes. So you auditioned for these two for a show called Preludes, and you yeah. did not get the role. Correct. And in fact, that audition sort of opens the door for you to get the role here. What, what's the sort of... How does that work for all of you? I mean, you're rejected and then accepted by the same team. I've never, I've never heard this story. I only oh. know it from, oh. I only know it from, from really? my side of things. Oh well, I mean, the story, the story is you were like truly one of the finalists for Natalia, <laughs> who is Rachmaninoff's character, uh, wife in Preludes, which is a show that Dave and I made at LCT three la uh, last year. Yeah. And, um, and we loved you and it ended up feeling like the role needed to be someone a little bit more mature um, and was played by the fabulous Nikki James. But I feel like at, at the level that Dave and I are doing it, auditions, it's, we're never seeing someone who's a bad actor. It's just a question as to whether they're the right fit for a role. So you're constantly um, just building up your knowledge and familiarity with this ecosystem that is our, that is our world. And yeah. so. Um, and just, so when this came around, it was... Yeah, and like you're constantly filing people like, oh my God, I've got to work with her someday. Like, you know, yeah. like every... Right. Yeah, when you see auditions, it's just, it's heartbreaking because you want to cast... Sometimes yeah. you want to cast everyone you see. You know, yeah. there's so many right. amazing actors and yeah. Great. <laughs> so we have some pictures from earlier productions of the show that I thought would help us talk about what the show is. Oh. If we can look at the first one. Um, we're not really going to be able to see it, but you get the oh, idea. Oh, I know this wow. one. Though. Good, because yeah. you're the one I'm going to ask oh, about Oh, great. It. Um, so, all right, so I think this is from Ars Nova, which is the no, first, this you, you is think it's the tent? Definitely the tent. You sure? Oh, 100%. All right, uh, so talk to us a little about uh, your tackling this show that's, um, what, it's about a beautiful girl from the outskirts of Moscow who's engaged, who comes into the city. Yeah. To, past time while her fiance's away and trouble ensues. Yes. So how do you think about what that should look like and how does it wind up in a scene like this? Right. 
Okay. Um, so <laughs> there's so many things that happen. Well, so first, your composer tells you a story, which either I can quickly retell or Dave can tell. Um, story? The, uh, about how oh, you were thinking show. about what the show should look like. Tell us a story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, the basic setup is, is uh, that this, woman, this young woman, Natasha, is. Oh, no, tell your Captain Margarita story. I don't know how you story. thought about what oh, it should like, look like. Why do we get to this? Oh, well, it's actually, I, so I unearth a, a little uh, a lie. Uh oh. Well, it's not a total lie, but I actually, so I've told this Cafe Margarita story, which is still very true, but I actually realized that I had come up with the immersive dinner club setting uh, before I ever went to Cafe Margarita. Perfect. Yeah, like two months before. We're going to so leave it at Cafe Margarita. actually because I had done another show, which is actually the show how Rachel and I met, uh, called Beowulf yeah. A Thousand Years of Baggage, which was a rock opera based on Beowulf. And we one night, yes. as you do. Um, I, I love the titles of your shows. You oh, yeah. told me the two titles before Beowulf. Which, uh, oh, well, there's so many. Clown Bible is one. Clown Bible. Uh, Sandwich. Sandwich. That's an old the musical, one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. The 99 Cent Miss Saigon was an old Oh, thing. sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but this, this production of Beowulf, so we, we wanted to do a show for our friends, so we did it in this very, like, shoddy loft space in, in, in San Francisco. And there was, we, we got the band on the stage, and then there was no room left over for the actors. Um, so we just had, so there was just no room for the actors. So the actors were like, oh, well, I guess we'll just have to like do it on the floor. And like we didn't rehearse this at all. Like, it was a very last minute kind of, you know, uh, throw, thrown together kind of thing. And so we ended up staging these like epic, you know, battles between Beowulf and Grendel, like in the middle of the audience. And like people were like sitting on the floor, and people had like bags of whiskey, and they were drinking, and it was like all our friends. They were singing along, and it was this amazing immersive experience. And we were like, yeah. I, after that experience, I was like, I never want to do theater and like a proscenium theater again. Like I always want to have that level of engagement with yeah, the audience. Yeah. Um, and then this was confirmed for me, then I went to, to Moscow a few, uh, a few months later and went to this amazing club called Cafe Margarita. If you're ever in Moscow, you have to seek out <laughs> this place because it was this tiny, tiny club and uh, they had vodka on every table and you know dumplings on every table and they also had shakers on every table. They, they were like, basically these li little plastic yogurt uh, containers that were filled with gravel and, uh, and there was like a little band playing piano, violin, viola, and they were playing like Flight of the Bumblebee and that kind of stuff. And everyone in the bar was like, had these shakers and just shaking along to the music. And it was just an epic, epic night. And I was sitting right next to the viola player. So the viola player was like in my ear. Yeah. And so yeah, I just felt like I was part of the, part of the, 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 the action. Yeah, and so yeah. Dave tells me that story and then Mimi Leanne, our set designer, that story. And um, and so this idea of spreading the musicians out through the room was actually the first. So you can sort of see over on the far right, there's that guy in gold standing next to the gold pillar <laughs> mid. And that's sort of where part of the pit is. There's some musicians in there. But what you can see is over here in the picture is our clarinetist and over here outside of the picture is our oboist and way back there up on the upper left is our string trio so 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 this idea of spreading the musicians out immediately means a that every audience member is going to have this very different intimate sonic relationship to each of the instruments and then separately there was just a whole you know requirement to tell the story of war and peace and so Mimi and I and Paloma Young, our, set, our uh, costume designer, um, felt like it was really important to create a visual space that could do and feel Russian opulence. Um, I think Mimi described wanting to try to create the inside of like a Fabergé egg. Um, and so the gold and the red velvet and these old pictures um, all over the walls but if you look at the pictures, um, there's classic paintings from all through Russia, but there's also a picture of Pussy Riot on the wall. <laughs> and p a huge part of that is because Dave's score create, uh, contains this incredible combination of really classic, beautiful music theater arias and really pounding techno moments and electronica all through. Um, and so we needed to create a space that felt that way. Um, and that combination of life is really like the fuel behind the design for the show. So let's look at the next image. 
So Dave, this is you. Ah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Pierre, the role that Josh is now playing. Yeah. Smaller gun. Smaller, yeah. yeah. Everything's gotten bigger. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, Dave, about uh, creating a role and then handing it off. Yeah. Uh, what is that like? Well, this is actually a great example of that. So I, I am definitely a composer first and uh, a performer maybe fifth or sixth <laughs> in my list of like how I self-identify. Um, so originally, like, I really was attracted to the role of Pierre because he's very inert for much of the show. Like, he just kind of like hides behind the piano and he doesn't like interacting with people. Um, and so at the end, of, so there's this moment in Act One where uh, Pierre engages in this duel uh, with another character, Dolokhov, and he basically, he, he tries to kind of kill himself in the process of this duel. And at the end of the duel, he doesn't die. And in my version of the show, uh, I just sang, such a storm of feelings. And that was my big internal moment about, <laughs> about you know, what, what the duel had done to me. And, and then I left the show, and then I would like start watching the show, and I'd be like, oh, Pierre probably could have a really big song there. That's a really important <laughs> moment. He just tried to kill himself. Maybe he has a little more to say than just such a storm of feelings. If only you know, a real performer was playing the role. Then, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so it's been such a gift to, like, to, to be able to step out of the role and to have someone as incredible as Josh step into the role and like someone who can actually um, uh, sing in <laughs> actual way. So now there's this epic seven minute aria that, bas that really literally takes the place of the line such a storm of feeling. Um, so yeah, it's been an amazing process to be able to step out and kind of see, oh, what does a show really need mm. right. that not hindered by my own performance anxiety. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the next image. Oh. All right, so, so this is Natasha on the left, uh, at the time played by Philippa Sue, who went on to, uh, to join Hamilton. Um, and Danae, I was hoping you could sort of tell us a little about who Natasha is and what you've learned about this character. Um, it's funny, at first glance, and when you hear no one else, she sort of seems like, you know, your typical ingenue Cinderella type. And I remember when we first started working on no one else, you said something to me about her arrogance, which I had never considered, like how arrogant you have to be to assume that you're the only person in the world who understands this feeling of love. And um, I've, I've just learned more about that and her confidence and her boldness to be this teenage girl with so much pressure and for her to have the courage to do what she wants to do, even if it ends up being a catastrophic decision. Um, and so I've just learned a, a little bit more about that and tried to even take on a little bit more mm. of that kind of freedom and that um, kind of like, no, I know myself better than you do. And I think she really feels that way, like um, to have that kind of self-knowledge and allow yourself to be swept up in something that excites you. So I think she's, a, she's far more interesting than sort of your typical sweet ingenue that you feel sorry for, for falling for the bad boy. That's right. yeah. You know, you don't feel so sorry for her because she was really active in these decisions. She was not duped, you know? She was like, yeah, I like him, but I'm gonna do this. Right. <laughs> and people tried to stop her, and she was like, no. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. Right. Uh, one more photo. Uh, so this is Pierre again, and Josh, I was hoping you could tell us a little about what this character is like. <laughs> well. The arc of Pierre is so wonderful, both in the book and in this show. It's such a, it's such a fun journey to take throughout the course of the show. And Pierre, you mentioned that what his relationships with, you know, he has come into a lot of money. Um, he's never been very popular, but now he's rich, and so he gets invited out more. <laughs> and he's mar he married the hot, the hot girl who doesn't really love him very much, and I don't think there's much of a connection there. And, Deep down, he knows that she maybe isn't all that faithful. And so he's conflicted. He's constantly trying to battle between his wants and his needs and his view of the world, but also with society and what his pressures are and what he needs to bring to that. And Rachel kind of mentioned him as being kind of a sad clown. You know, he wants so badly to be part of that, but he's too conflicted to allow himself to enjoy what he sees around him every single day. And at the end of the day, he does view it as futile. He does view it as petty. He is, his mind is in the stars. His mind is, in, uh, is very um, much about what does it all mean? What does my life mean? What have I done? He's full of regret. So, you know, there is, I think, a constant battle brewing in, in him throughout the course of the show. And the people that he interacts with in the book and in the show 
help draw out those different conflicts in different ways. And so, um, you know, by the time, you know, he he finally feels a spark of something, you know, and he finally has that moment where for the, maybe the first time in his whole life, there's a feeling of joy, a feeling of love. Um, it's, it's taken a long way to get there. And it's, uh, it's a great, it's a great challenge. It's a, it's a, I, the, the song that, that Dave is referring to that he wrote for that arc, which I think was so, so beautiful and so important to tell, to kind of piece together some, some of the things that he's going through. Um, is is just is wonderful. It takes it, it takes me with it whether I'm feeling it at the beginning of the day or not. You know, it's so. Um, I think that that along with the fact that with this particular version of it to be able to play you know the accordion and and to be able to jam on a musical level too um, is um, is something is a challenge that I don't think I'd be able to find really anywhere else, uh, and and only for me accentuates just how. Um, how much is spinning and how much is going on in his world. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a huge challenge, but it's a, it's a great one. It's a lot of fun. Mm. Well, let, let me ask you both to sort of follow up on that question of finding aspects of these characters that are different from yourselves. You're both, I'm told, really nice. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, your characters have some edge, right? I mean, arguably your character is sort of intoxicated with her own, I don't know, desirability. Yeah. And it's yours is sort of, nar yeah. Totally. <laughs> it's and still your character is yeah. just intoxicated. Yeah, that's exactly right. In general. Uh, <laughs> in general. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, yours is sort of a depressive and yours is sort of, you know, that little bit smug. So w where, where do you go to, f like, find parts of these characters yeah. that are not you? When I was an audience member and experiencing it for the first time in the tent, I was taken with just how relatable these characters were in present day uh, and how there's something really in all of them that we can all relate to in present day. Mm -hmm. um, personally, with Pierre, um, there are sides of Pierre that are, um, you know, I think rather universal. The, uh, and certainly to me, the overthinking side, the uh, sometimes not living in the moment, celebrating the things in front of you side, seeing the forest through the trees. We all go through those moments. We all have dark times that we can relate to that, um, where we don't feel like we're part of the party. Um, but then there are parts of Pierre that um, take a lot of um, imagination and a lot of sympathy and a lot of um, diving into what that must have been like. and um, And so, you know, from, from a personal standpoint, vocally and just being me, um, it's really fun to leave certain parts at the door when I walk into those shoes because um, he, is, he is a complete alcoholic. I mean, he does have a, um, a bull in a china shop uh, you know, vibe to him that um, I'm always generally, um, you know, pretty careful and, you know, try to say the right things mm -hmm. and things like that. And Pierre is just so the opposite of that, that it's actually really freeing to kind of take off that hat mm -hmm. and just say, screw it. You know, yeah. Pierre is just like, <laughs> Pierre is so, I mean, he's just tripping over his own life. And, and to, coming from a world where I've had to be very careful so much of the time to play a character that is so not that, that if I'm, if I'm bashing out chords on the piano during one of the dance scenes, and I, you know, mess up a chord and have a bottle in my hand, then fuck it. You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's great to have, it's, it's, it's really fun, and it's been a great exercise for me, and it's the thing that I love most about um, theater and acting and doing this kind of thing is, is the chance to fully embrace that and live in that, at least for the two hours that you're allowed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of two hours, though. It eight is, eight no. Times, like, <laughs> eight times a week. We, we ran the whole second half today, and after the final song, we all just went, woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We needed a recharge. Right. I feel very similarly in the sense that um, I think that I'm a very considerate person. I think a lot about how what I can say affects others and all those types of things. and so. It's incredible to step into the shoes of someone who really not only says what she thinks, but thinks that everyone should really see what she sees. And there's like, 
any child or person who becomes an actor, I'll speak for myself, but there's an element of us who loves the center of the attention. And you know, you you're supposed to- You can speak for me too. <laughs> exactly, like, <laughs> you love being loved and desired and all these things, but you know, you're supposed to be like modest and humble and you know. And Natasha just gets to be like, no, I'm awesome. Everyone thinks I'm awesome right now. And I'm gonna tell everyone that they think that I'm awesome. And it's, it's, it's really invigorating to really go fully there but then she's also been written so beautifully to have such an arc of like, kind of the arc that we all go through when we realize that we're not the center of the world and that things don't always go as incredibly as we planned because something that I do connect to Natasha with is like, I am a blind optimist. Like I'm like, this is gonna be the best day and I have the best life and everything's gonna be amazing. And so I really connect to her in that sort of phase growing up to see like, okay, how do I keep the sparks of myself that I like while realizing there's a real world full of danger and hurt around you? And so, but it's fun in those, some of those moments in the opera where she's like, they're all looking at me, they're all talking about me, they all like me so much, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's so fun to really get to say that and not have to like write it in your diary, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's very cool. Fantastic. All right, let's talk a little bit about Broadway because the one thing that all four of you have in common is that you're making your Broadway debuts. That's true. Um, yeah, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Josh, why don't I start with you? Uh, you went to a performing arts high school. Mm -hmm. You dreamt of going into theater. In fact, you started a musical theater program. You did. But your career led you dramatically elsewhere uh, and you know you've accomplished so much why come back to this? Hmm. Uh, it, there was never a question in my mind that at some point I would. Um, I, it was a it was a time out not uh, not a cancellation of that dream and um, you know when you're I was 17 when I was signed to my record label I was a freshman at Carnegie Mellon University I was a musical theater major there and we were, a, um, we were a particularly talented class, too. There were only 14 of us musical theater majors, and then um, the rest of the school was like rocket scientists and architects. <laughs> um, so we were just kind of in our own little clique. And my class, I mean, my dorm, we were, we were just, it was Leslie Odom Jr., it was Josh Gad, it was Rory O'Malley, it was Katie Mixon. We were all in the same, same 14 people class. So we all knew that, you know, the cool thing about what CMU did was they all, they, they, hi they hired. Um, they, they accepted people that were very different. It wasn't, it wasn't just cookie cutter. Every one of us had a really interesting kind of nuance to what it was we had to offer. But um, ultimately, before I had gone to my freshman year at Carnegie Mellon, I had already been discovered by David Foster and by Warner Brothers Records, and they were already kind of saying, well, we'd like to, we'd like to offer you this opportunity. And I was conflicted. I was really conflicted. I had long talks about it with my parents. Um, I had a lot of soul searching to do and I sat on my dorm bed and I just said to myself, you know, if I don't try this, um, if I look at it as a master class of something that I could learn from and if I take a leave of absence and if I go and I, and I explore this world, what will I be thinking to myself the next three and a half years? Will I always wonder what if? Because I also knew how hard it is sometimes after four years, the doors close and you're, you're out in that world whether you do it whether in your freshman year or if you do it after your senior year. So um, my parents were very supportive. I went for it. Knowing how fickle the music business can be, I was half expecting to be back in class in three months. Like I, I really, in some ways, I thought to myself, well, let's just see where this goes. And um, you know, and it, it turned out to be a really wonderful thing. And it turned out to be the greatest lesson I could have ever learned. And it introduced me in a whole new way to the theater community. And 15, 16 years later, to be back doing this, um, it, timing is everything. It had to be the right show. It had to be a time when my cycle could just end for a minute because it's always you record, then you go on tour, and then by the time your tour is done, it's been two years, so you've got to go record again. And you have to move very, very fast, and you're always on that ride. So um, I just decided it was time to just say, now's the time. I feel like I've had enough life experience. I feel old enough. I feel ready for the material. And um, and I felt like I'd, I'd done enough in seven albums, and four tours to uh, to say, okay, this one's this one's for you. You know, you go go enjoy yourself. You know, and uh, so it's. Uh, 
I, 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 I think that I'm, I'm actually now in a, in a strange way, and the universe is weird. I'm just, I, mean, I am glad that it happened the way it did. I'm glad that I waited um, for this show and for this experience, because I think it, it feels really right. And, and what do you think it is about theater that, that beckoned you? Like, what, what is it you're seeking? Well, I mean, in some ways, um, the same thing that I loved about even being myself and singing songs that I love, it's telling stories. It's connecting with people musically in a way that you can't in your everyday life. Um, music's always done that for me, whether it was theater or otherwise. But the added pleasure of theater is that you get to fully immerse yourself in that story. You're not yourself telling the story. You are the story. And, um, and I just, I always loved pretending when I was a kid. I always loved locking myself in my room and inventing characters and coming up with scene ideas. And, um, and then when I went to an arts high school, the, the most at peace I ever felt, the most myself I ever felt, was when I was with more theater people, when we were exploring a show together and diving into a show together. So I've always felt a real connection to that world, and I've always been very honored to have had friends in that world throughout the course of my music career. But, um, but jumping into it now, and, I, and I'm very much um, a, a newbie to this, and we're working we're doing such amazing work, and, and it's been really um, a very fast learning experience, learning curve to do that. But even in that learning curve, this process has made me feel still like, oh yeah, this is yeah, this is where yeah, this is, this is, these are my people. <laughs> yeah, this, you know, so um, so it's been it's been really cool to feel that. Dina, you also went to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you graduated, but before you did, you got cast in uh, the road production of Book of Mormon. Uh, so tell me about the role of Broadway in your imagination. Is this something you knew you wanted since girlhood, or how, how did you wind up here? Um, it's certainly something that I always dreamed of. I loved singing and performing, and I think my parents recognized that in me at a young age. So I was in church choir and did all the school plays and things, but I never quite understood how people got there. <laughs> you know, wherever there was, when you come to New York and you see people on TV, you're like, so did they get us discovered in Starbucks? Like, you know, it's like, I didn't know what an agent was. Like, you don't really have, I didn't have a concept, right? You know, I was growing up in Central Florida, and I didn't have a concept of, like, what the steps actually were. Mm -hmm. And so I happened, I went to a really academic high school, and so I thought I was going to go to school for journalism or something. And I think I also lacked a little confidence in whether or not I was actually good enough or there was actually a role in which I fit. I never felt like I, you know, in the acting world you talk a lot about your type and the type of show you do and the type of voice you have and I never quite felt like I saw something that I was like, oh, that's, I'm the person that people look for for that type of thing. So I think that kind of kept me from really committing fully to the dream, even though it very actively was my dream. And um, I had a really amazing theater teacher in high school who really picked both of them and picked incredible shows and exposes to really wonderful work and picked shows where I could be highlighted and discover my talents and work through some of those fears. And the summer before senior year, I'd already done all my college visits and I did a production of Aida and it all sort of clicked and it clicked for my parents and I came to them and I was like, I wanna go to school for theater. And I had a friend who was also going to school for theater so I just kind of like, took her college audition list and mm. we prepared our monologues together and we had you know it was so funny meeting kids once I got to college and you know who had been meeting with audition coaches and things like that and I was doing my monologues for my best friend in the mirror and it was like uh, once I got to college I think is where like the real training began and I understood the real steps that it took to become an actor in the business side of everything but before then it was really timing and meeting the right people at the right time who sort of introduced me to the next step that you take, you know? But how lucky were we that we had parents and teachers that really yeah. pushed that out? It was us. everything. Because we were both, I think, we were a little different in age, but, um, but we both, I think, were equally wide-eyed and bushy-tailed early on as far as just like, how do you get to that point? I just know yeah. that I'm really feeling good doing this in front of my mirror, <laughs> exactly. but what is that thing out there, that thing? <laughs> and you know, when you're wondering about those things, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of clueless a little bit. And so you're shy. I, I was a little shy about it. I knew I had this thing, but I, I didn't know how to do it. But yeah, having parents that support that and having teachers that give you that push when you won't push yourself is such a key to, um, to discovering that in yourself. It's why arts education is 
so important. It's so me. important. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um. So, Dave and Rachel, I want to ask you a little about Broadway as well, because I'm always fascinated by this question. I think of you both as downtown artists who are working on this kind of experimental shows. A lot of what you've been involved with is, um, and I don't mean this in any pejorative kind of way, but is, is pretty clearly non-commercial. And uh, I, I always wonder like, where Broadway fits in your thinking about theater. Is Broadway representative of what's wrong with theater or what's right with theater? Or how do you imagine it before you get there? Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't think it's either of those things, right? Like the, I, I work a lot in London, uh, and I really love being abroad. Uh, and one of the reasons, I guess, is in the London ecosystem, in part because there's not like New York and LA, where you have this huge bifurcation of theaters here and film and TV are here, and then downtown and uptown, and that theater belongs there, and this theater belongs there. There's no, you'll find actors moving from a one person show for 60 people to the National Theater to a recurring role on the BBC. And that kind of fluidity of life feels so healthy to me. Um, and feels like something that certainly this show um, uh, is in step with. Because there's so many, like looking at all those pictures, um, there's so many values of the downtown that are absolutely like in terms of the that culture of life that Dave was describing in that Beowulf of uh, that intimacy um, and that pulse and really feeling it in your bones. I mean, that's a rock concert or that's going to um, a classical opera or um, uh, going to a sporting event. And those are all mainstream you know, pulse emotional places. And so it's really just about, um, just about the story you're telling of whether it has more universal resonance, wider resonance or not. So I guess I, I, poke, at the, I poke at that bifurcation. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I mean, to, I, and I actually just hearing you talk about like teachers and parents, like that was such a part of I was brought up, like my parents took me to see like the Rolling Stones and Prince, but my dad like also took me to see like Laurie Anderson when I was 10, right. you know? And so I was exposed and like, you know, we would watch like David Lynch films and like, you know, really kind of more experimental stuff. So I was very much raised in both worlds. And then my, my high school uh, music teachers as well, like they would expose me to, you know, Mozart and Brahms, but also George Crumb and Stravinsky and, and wild vocal jazz. and. So yeah, I just kind of grew up with all of those things in my head and like the way I listen to music to this day is I'll typically like put my whole collection on shuffle. So it'll be like the most popular things and the most avant-garde weird things just all smashed together. Um, so when I got into theater, like there was never, yeah, the same way, there was never that division to me. Like, oh, I can't, you know, Broadway is this and downtown is this. Like I was always interested in, in mixing the two. So it's been so thrilling to, to finally get to do that, you know, on the actual venue of Broadway. It's amazing. So. Let's talk about Josh for a little bit. Um, <laughs> Josh, would you leave, please? Yeah, yeah, I'll be. <laughs> All right, so this show is uh, doing great off-Broadway. Um, you want to bring it to Broadway, it seems possible. Uh, and you have to think about casting. And your producers say to you, let's talk about Josh, knowing Josh has an interest in the show. And if I have this right, the three of you have a kind of late night phone call and then you're like, oh, we're gonna have a first date and you all meet at a bar in Tribeca. So what you know that you need somebody to help make this project viable, but you're also reluctant to work with somebody who's gonna be impossible. Um, <laughs> so, so I don't blame him. <laughs> so, what is yeah. the nature of that first conversation? Like, what happens? What are you all looking for? And Josh, you too, as you're sort of assessing, do we really want to well, we, we work together? We talked so mm -hmm. early. I mean, I felt like at the point that we started the conversation, they, it, it could have so easily at any point gone, well, you know, oh, love your stuff, love yours, all right, well, be good yeah. out there. Uh, there was no pressure. There was no feeling of like nobody was pushing us to each other. No, don't, totally. Uh, it, it was just, I, you know, I was intrigued by the murmurs, basically, that this was going to see 
um, Broadway finally. And so I just thought, well, what's the, what's the worst that can happen? I, I wanted to just express interest. And, um, and I think Howard Kagan at the same time was kind of saying, well, I think Josh might like this. He's the commercial producer he is, yeah. to the yeah. show. Yeah. And, um, and so it did. It started with a really kind of, well, more awkward for you than me because you were in, where were you, yeah, Berlin? So this, I should say this first phone call was <laughs> the most surreal phone call of my life because all three of us, we were literally in three different time zones. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I, I drew the short straw. I was in Berlin, so I got to talk at 4 a.m. And we were in, like, it was my wife and I, we were traveling, and we were in this tiny Airbnb, and I'm like, Eliza, I... I have to wake up at, at 4 a.m. to talk to Josh Groban. Is that okay? I, I had no idea. I had no idea. Somebody, I and forgot who it was that set up the phone yeah. call. But they were like, no, it's fine. He's, it's he's fine. I'm like, I, I think I, is, is there possibly any other time? And they were like, you no, it's got to be, you know, because it was like, both, both of you had insane schedules yeah, and yeah. I was just traveling. So. I am impossible. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. <laughs> I, think it was, I think at that point, maybe your schedule was even worse. It's pro you know. probable. Yeah, I was yeah. just You sounded like you were hiding in a cupboard. I was, like in, a, you I was were, in this you tiny were, kitchen. You were in a little I kitchen. Was in a, I was trying not to talk too loud like, so I'm my gonna be quiet. poor yeah. wife could sleep. And yeah. here I'm, and yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm such a fan of his work and I'm think, I'm getting real nervous about making the call and I'm nervous to talk to Dave Malloy, and and I'm thinking to my and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself and I'm thinking like, oh man, he's really he's really quiet and eccentric. <laughs> he's like he's keeping it close to the vest. What a genius! What a genius! Because like they were all they were like quiet one word answers and they were like now I know he didn't want to wake up his wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, were, and you were like backstage before going on to, to sing yeah, in like yeah. LA, you were right? I was performing that. Yeah, he was like, oh yeah, I'm backstage. I'm, I'm supposed to sing in 10 minutes, but yeah, let's anyway. talk a little more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Horrible timing like for both of us. I don't know who said that call. It was really, yeah. So, so I think it, was, it wasn't a long call. We decided, hey, when we're all in New York, let's yeah. get a drink. Let's have so. a cocktail. Let's have a cocktail. Yeah. And so what are you then looking for? What is it that you're, what are you assessing at this, at this bar? I mean, I think I was, so, I mean, I had I had seen a lot of Josh's work, so I was. I mean, the moment that Josh's name came up, it was like, yes, that's the correct. That is the correct fit for this role. And then it was just. I mean, a it was getting to know you a little bit more personally to make sure that we would have a good rapport. Right. Um, and I, you know, knowing I like I said, we all got sent that beautiful picture of you with the cast. So like, <laughs> yeah. I knew that you loved the show, and that by extension you would trust me so far as the show went if yeah. nothing else yeah, absolutely and that you clearly were so interested in what this what the show was doing and what this moment for you was professionally in terms of taking the next step um, and then I'm just sitting there thinking okay so what is what is Josh's Pierre going to be um, how does the how does that quietness how does the fear of being out of your pit, which Dave talked about. How does the shoulders uh, function, all of that. So I'm just, the that's, the, of yeah, it, the, that's vocal, the work the I'm beginning to do. Right. Um, yeah. And that was my uh, conversation as well, was just the curiosity of how do we play with this? How do we, yeah. how much do I bring and how much do we play with? And, um, and so that's been a conversation we've been having ever since. Totally. And as we've been getting it on its feet, it's so fun and rewarding to feel that conversation coming to fruition and continuing to, to play with it, you know, in real time is uh, is great. But um, but but to have had that um, that trust and that um, excitement both ways, and to have it from somebody that I respect so deeply and trust so deeply, um, was it gave me I think a little bit of the magic feather too of like okay, this is something that that you know was an exciting idea, let's talk, let's get a drink. But I think after we had that drink, I started to get kind of excited. I got, got excited. I thought this is something that could yeah. actually really fit. And, um, and we've been playing with it ever since. Right. So let's talk a little about that process. So you come to this role, obviously, as this acclaimed singer with incredible vocal gifts. Uh, but acting is not something you've done a ton of. So there are all these things like, uh, how you move on stage that uh, you have to study, you have to learn. Mm -hmm. So what has the process been since you were cast in kind of reintroducing you to theater acting? Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's where a huge amount of the trust has had to come from because I'm in, so inside myself 
that I have to turn off my micromanaging brain and I have to allow myself to go there, even if it's too far, to make mistakes in front of my cast, to, um, to trip over myself a little bit and be uh, a mess a little bit, you know, in order to find where the line is, in order to find where I fit in this and how I, how I, how I move in that world and how I um, sing in that world and how I, you know, project this character. So um, it has been, a, it has been um, a muscle that has needed some real... Uh, it's been fun to get it back in the gym and flex that muscle, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and so it's been re it's it's been it's been equal parts um, gratifying and rewarding to 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 start tapping into that instinct again, but also um, it's been it's been fun and hard to um, to embrace the awkwardness of doing something that is right. again something I haven't done a whole lot of. Mm -hmm. um, and the wonderful thing about theater and the wonderful thing about working, working with someone like Rachel is that there is, you feel like everybody has your back. I'm working with people that are so wonderful to, to react to and they give you so much. This cast, everybody in the ensemble from the roving musicians to every lead on down uh, gives so much that your insecurity about your own abilities goes out the window because you realize around you what your bar is, and you realize what it is they're setting up for you to play off of. And yeah. all you have to do is, is, is do that. Yeah. And so really what it comes down to for me from an acting perspective is just allowing myself to just do it. And that's been really fun, and that's been really um, something that has been the most enjoyable with this. And having right. a brilliant director totally. certainly is a yeah, huge Rachel, part of that. let me ask you about this for yeah. you, because so you've directed lots of actors, but Josh is by far the most famous person you've directed. Yeah. So what does that place, how do you think about, uh, you know, do you have to pull your punches? Are there ways in which you have to behave differently because he's a celebrity? Are you comfortable uh, giving criticism <laughs> when She's something tough. doesn't I only, I only give direction through my assistant. No. Um, <laughs> No, no, I mean, I think, right, like, that's the, also that purpose of that phone call, is can yeah. we talk? And it, like, immediately the answer was so obviously yes. Um, and I think, um, uh, I imagine at some point in my life I will be in the room with a celebrity who I have to handle with kid gloves. Um, but the, like, you're so easy. <laughs> you're so pleasant. Okay. And you're also, you share a quality that so many people in the cast do, which is maybe not being an, an actor by most recent trade, mm. but being a musician and being a performer. And actually, when, when Dave and I were first casting the show, the cast was quite evenly and quite deliberately split between people who really had major acting chops and people who had never acted in their lives but were these divine musicians, right. whether that meant players or uh, singer-composers. And so I remember Britton Ashford, who plays Sonia, Natasha's best friend, during a rehearsal, Britton is a musician uh, first by trade, and this was at Ars Nova, and Britton sort of was like mid asking a question one day in rehearsal, and she was like, "How do you?" And I was like, "Are we talking about a cross?" And she was like, "No. How, how do you act?" <laughs> and before I could say anything, Amber Gray and Lucas Steele, who both are major acting chops, flew at her and were just like, "No, no," because what this show wants is because the audience, some of the audience is hundreds of feet away, but some of the audience is as close to Josh as I am to him right now. And so you actually have to be comfortable operating as much as if for film, as much as for opera. Right. And so, you know, it comes back to the fact that it truly was this incredibly beautiful fit of Josh and Pierre together. And so, so there's a certain degree to which it's just about saying you have the permission to live in your skin. We'll pad you out a little bit, but <laughs> it's your fingers slamming the piano and it's your eyes meeting mine when you sing you know, this line in the soliloquy. So it's really just about that honesty. But tell me, like you once told me that you had Josh going through these uh, exercises where you were trying to imagine 
uh, sort of Pierre's internal life, you mm. know, different, some acting exercises. What do we do? Talked about daydreaming. Yeah. And just filling in that kind of backstory. So daydreaming is where the actor... I mean, right, there's all the different like acting methods um, derived from different periods of Stanislavski in his life in terms of creating an emotional reality for the character. And um, I think I most subscribe to that you don't necessarily have to have lived it because, you know, um, you know, help us with some of these plays. You hope that you haven't lived Medea. Um, <laughs> but, but you can fill in what that level of pain is by daydreaming and essentially building, building a fictional history mm -hmm. for yourself that then your muscles can access when it comes time to do the thing that she does. Or in this, yeah. when Pierre starts the show by saying, I, it suddenly occurred to me that I can't continue. I just can't continue anymore. And so we would talk about what the moments, like the literal moments and weeks and months have been leading up to the second before you sing that first line. There's, I, what I loved is that there's just such a huge amount of note taking and preparation and, um, and imagining uh, to fill in the missing parts of the molecule. So that, mm -hmm. like, like she said, once you are, get into the repetition of it, it starts to become part of your DNA. Um, and I, um, you know, I, there's so much to take from with him that, um, you know, it, it, it does start to, it does start to feel like you're, 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 in, you're in the right skin at a certain mm. point. And, um, and I've, I've loved those exercises. I, I love the awkwardness of them sometimes. I love, um, you know, it's been, it's been really, it's been really fun. And even vocally, you've been working. I know, you know, when you sort of Google your voice, the adjectives most used are pure and angelic. And we've talked I've about this. I've never done that. Is that yeah. it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> pure, <laughs> angelic, sucks. Yes. <laughs> but Pierre, um, I mean, you've talked about needing to sort of rough up your voice for some of Pierre's scenes mm -hmm. because he's probably not pure and angelic. Correct. So w what does that mean for you? Well, I think that w what's been fun is, is using years of technique as a, as a foundation allows you to then choose what color you put on that technique. And, um, and so I'm always meticulous with my voice, whether I'm singing in, in, on the fringe or whether I'm singing purely. Um, Stamina is always something I'm always considering. Where, where I place a note is something I'm always considering. But the trick of it is to do the work so that it sounds rough. It sounds like you're not doing it with technique, but you are. And so um, it's, been, it's been really fun to explore all the many genres of music that Dave has in this show. To, um, because there are, real, there are operatic moments in this. There are very dramatic operatic moments where I feel I can put the gas pedal down and I can sing full out. And then there are moments that are um, very intimate to the point where it's unusual for me to sing that softly. Um, and then there's straight up rock singing too. So um, you know, it's uh, it really comes down to um, song by song, figuring out where the balance is. It's all about right. balance, and it's that conversation of how much do I bring and how much do I bring to me. And I think I've found that that happy medium yeah. vocally right. of, of where that sits um, in a way that uh, feels really good to sing eight hours a day. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still, you know, <laughs> feeling, you know, so, uh, so it's, it's um, you know, it, it's, so far it's, it's been something that I was overthinking as perhaps being a challenge for me uh, and a challenge for me in this role. Mm -hmm. And as I've been doing it more and more actually has felt um, really very comfortable. So, Danae, I wanted to ask you, Rachel told me that you had once made a comment about how you didn't think you would ever get to play the girl in the corset. I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little about like, what your thinking was about what kinds of roles would be available to you and what would not, and what the significance is of being cast as a Russian countess. Uh, do you have all night? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> it means so many things. I think that the dilemma that I always had for myself was, you know, a lot of times sort of traditional roles that are written for black women 
fall into certain tropes that may be truthful, but they're limiting. And so in musical theater, you know, everyone's looking for that gospel sound and that belt, which is a, I grew up going to a Pentecostal church and those are the voices that I was compared mine to. And it's not that, you know, it's like, I will not have people shouting down the aisles with the sound that I create. And so I would look at roles and I'd be like, well, I can't do that. But then I would see roles like Wicked or like Into the Woods and, and love them and take to them and the pride and prejudices of the world. I was such a hopeless romantic, but I didn't look like anyone. And so it was often like, well, I don't know if there's a place for me in this industry or in this type of field, but I loved it so much. And so um, being the hopeless romantic that I was, I loved watching the story where you had the the Jane Eyres who were, you know, living their truth and falling in love and dealing with all these things in their corsets and in their, in the beautiful lighting and the slow shots on Rachel McAdams and all those things. And it's so silly, but you really compare yourself if you never see someone who looks like you doing those things. So you're either like, I'm not beautiful enough or I'm not talented enough, or they don't think I'm beautiful enough or talented enough. And it plays with your psychology. So to have an opportunity where um, gathering the courage to be yourself outside of what you feel like has been decided for you mm -hmm. and then having it pay off is an incredible feeling and um, I hope it's an incredible feeling to be given this opportunity to be in the position where other little black girls might get to skip that step of fear and of wasting time trying to be things that they're not and realizing how many incredible things they have to offer and um, my dad used to always say this thing. I'm not sure if it's scripture or if it's a scripture that he made up, but <laughs> which he does that. Dad scripture. But the concept that your gifts will make room for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have the courage to walk in your truth, that the world and the universe will find a way to make it work for you. And um, so I'm thankful. I hope that the industry keeps going in that direction uh, to really, there's so much incredible talent out there. And this show, even outside of the racial aspect, outside of the fact that the musicians, the, you know, Gelsey who plays Princess Mary has like a PhD in something incredible that has to do with vocal production and she can make like... Performance studies. Yes, performance studies. but she can make any sound with her voice and it's not something that I'm sure she fit into the 16 bar cut musical theater world, That's right. yeah. but they need it, we need her and, it, and it's incredible what stories can be told and how much talent is on that stage and people are going to be dumbfounded at what happens when you break your limitations that weren't founded on any truth in the first place. Right. I think that's an experience probably shared by a lot of people in this cast as far as the yeah. worlds they're coming from in this show. It's, it's, um, it's inspiring to see that around, around us. Yeah. Wow. And so much of that I actually feel like <coughs> comes from the Tolstoy. Like Tolstoy is this amazing writer who writes about, you know, for him he was writing about all of Russia. Like, you know, Napoleon and the Tsar are characters in War and Peace, as is Balaga, who's like the lowliest, craziest, you know, peasant troika driver. So he's like really painting this picture of like what is all of humanity possible. Mm, yeah. So like for us, it's just like, well, how do you translate that into 21st century New York, you know? And, and it just means, yeah, having the most diverse cast in every single way possible. So mm. people from all different walks of life. And, and like that's also part of the immersive staging. So totally. then the audience becomes part of the show too. Yeah. So we actually have a cast of thousands. You know, we see everyone in the audience is a part of the show that we're watching. So you get this huge portrait of this is all that humanity can be. Great. I'm guessing that uh, those of you in the audience may have some questions. Uh, I don't know, are there microphones somewhere? Um, so if you do, um, please raise your hands. We have some uh, from Twitter as well. Um, and I have a few more <laughs> on my notes, so <laughs> we'll run through them. While people line up, Rachel, let me ask you a little about gender and directing, because as I'm sure you're aware, women continue to be quite dramatically underrepresented as directors on Broadway. Yeah. Uh, I think you may be one of two women directing new musicals on Broadway this season. Wow. Um, do you think gender makes a difference in, uh, in directing? Um, no, I don't think it makes a difference in directing. I think it makes a difference in terms of how you, uh, how either the world gives you quote unquote permission to speak up and represent yourself and get a job. Um, and I think it even more so uh, impacts um, what it takes to, you know, uh, 
trust someone. You hear this a lot with women in the film industry as to like that a, a single successful breakout film can land a male director a hundred forty million dollar action movie, whereas it takes a woman ten successful independent films to get to the same spot. Um, but no, I don't think it impacts. There are there are. Um, men who create motherly rooms and women who create icy rooms and uh, and I don't think it has too much to do with who you are as an artist right great um, yes two quick questions one for Dave I'm just curious were you on a world cruise when you were reading Tolstoy <laughs> and what was the name of the ship <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't remember. It was a celebrity cruise, and I believe it was a Bermuda cruise. It was New York to Bermuda. I don't you remember the name. You went back and forth a lot, or you read fast? What's that? You went back and forth a lot. Yeah, I'm yeah. Familiar with that I mean, I did cruises <laughs> off and on for like four or five years. So I did Alaska, oh, the yeah. Mediterranean, oh, yeah, the Caribbean, and, and That's Bermuda. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I thought I'm maybe. Sorry, you were, I didn't meet you. I would have talked to you. I was going to say, I thought you oh. might have thought you were there. I didn't know. Like, it, it felt like a Craigslist misconnection there for a second. Celebrity? Did you do celebrity? No, no, uh, no. The, celebrity is great. The Italian line, I'd the highly... French line, the Greek line, but in the seventies before you were born. Oh, yeah. I was born and in Josh, the seventies. Were you were you uh, playing the accordion when you were singing in front of the mirror when you were young? No, or is the accordion is entirely new to me for this. Um, and how many hours do you have to practice a day? Well, I, I've I've <laughs> I've used well, you know, I took it with me on my I went on a world tour this whole last year. <gasps> And we did over 100 concerts, and, and I have a two-hour period between sound check and when I have to get ready for my show. And during that period, I would play the accordion. And That's so, um, so I guess if you do the math, it's been a lot of hours. Wow, but, um, but so you know, so yeah, this, so that, that accordion, I'm actually, I'm actually going to be playing that accordion on in this show. Oh. That accordion has been to South Africa with me, and New Zealand, oh, and all kinds of places. Yeah. So um, it's been on quite a journey. But um, the piano aspect of it is is fairly similar to the actual keys, yes. except it's sideways and you're, you're right. blind. Right, that's but. what I was thinking about, <laughs> the side <laughs> buttons. Yeah, it's, just, it takes, it's muscle memory. You've got to find, right, your, find right. your spots. Well, but, great. Thank you. I look forward you. to seeing you in November. Thank you. Okay. Yes? Hi. Um, my question is for Dave. So I was wondering, um, I read War and Peace, and I loved, um, I fell in love with the character of Andre. And so when I listened to this the first time, I really, I know he's like, not in it a lot, but I really highly disliked him. So oh. I want to know if, like, is that how you see the character, or is that what you thought, like, the show kind of needed at that point, or, like, what your thoughts of him and bringing that mm. sort of character, who's a main character of the book, but not necessarily the show? <coughs> um, yeah, you know, again, it, it was, people ask me sometimes, like, how did I pick this section of War and Peace? And it was never a matter of, like, oh, which section of War and Peace am I going to do? It was always, like, when I read this section, it just immediately spoke to me. And it just happens to be a section where, where Andre isn't here. Like, it's one of the lines of the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, I mean, I think his, his presence kind of hangs over the entire show. But, yeah, he, he only makes, you know, one actual speaking appearance. He makes several dream ballet appearances yeah. throughout the show. Yeah. Um, but we have often talked, you know, if, if we were to ever someday make a sequel, do like a war <laughs> section, like it, it would be the, the Battle of Austerlitz and his <laughs> amazing experience seeing the sky. The Great I mean, Comet too. Andre's yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Andre's here, exactly. Andre's here. Yeah. I mean, I love Andre. I, I love all the characters in War and Peace because they're all so complicated. Like all of them, you love them and you hate them and they're infuriating and they're intoxicating. And so I, you know, yeah, I love him. Thank you so much. Yes. Something that draws me to the show is really the intimacy of an audience member. Are you scared of this venue, this theater, a larger environment? And, and what are you doing to try to make sure it still keeps that intimacy from an audience member's point yeah, of view? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so as the show has scaled up, so too has the number of people in the cast, <laughs> quite simply. So when we were at Ars Nova, which was an 87-seat theater, um, we had 10 principals, no ensemble, and a band, I believe, of six. And then we added an ensemble of six to the cast for the tent. And then when we went to ART, we went all the way up to 24. And now we actually have 30 cast members on stage, uh, which is 
huge um, and uh, uh, a joy to wrangle in the rehearsal room. <laughs> um, they're amazing. Um, but, uh, but I think a huge part of how we arrived at 30 was trying to ensure that exact thing because the intimacy is not just like a, oh, and it's also intimate. You know, it's a, it's a core part of the DNA of the show. And so we, myself and Sam Pinkleton, our choreographer, spent a huge amount of time over the, the basically past year, including the lead up to ART, trying to map out and ensure that every member of the audience, including the very back of the mezzanine, um, and including the people at the rear of the orchestra, were within spitting distance of an ensemble member at truly every point that there is a large number happening. And I think every single principal comes out into the lower orchestra or mezzanine and both uh, multiple times throughout the show. So we wanted it to feel, um, to a certain extent, it is, a, it is a, um, uh, as Dave said, a, 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 there's this Tolstoy aspect that's crashing all these different streams of life together. And so we wanted the feeling of access to that intimacy to be as democratic as possible. And can you still get vodka at your seat? You can. You have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's no longer free as it was at Ars Nova. But yes, there will absolutely be vodka. Right. And Josh and Danae are both going to move through the audience? Oh, yeah. Danae does some really yeah. huge dancing all through the dancing. audience. I do some dancing. I do some dramatic walks along the mezzanine lighting. Yeah. There's, there's more stairs now. Our glutes are going to be... Yes. <laughs> yeah. ...by the end of this run. But, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole ensemble, all of us, we, we are mapping out in our staging um, how to get ourselves, not just the ensemble members, throughout the audience, throughout the mezzanine, at some point throughout the course of the show. Yeah. The, and the most amazing thing, too, about our rehearsal room is because of this, we've actually had to build a, a rehearsal room that kind of bends back on itself in a, in a super physic, physics, physics. Yeah. It's like a tesseract. Sure. Because, because we don't have the, 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 the mezzanine in the rehearsal room, so it actually like mirrors back. So at some point, people will like walk towards the wall, and then they have to flip around and go, OK, now I'm in the audience. But they're actually walking back towards the stage. It's mind bending. It is. Yeah. <laughs> We're constantly running over to the model. Also, box. mind bending. Tech yeah. Week is going to sure. be real mind bending. Yeah. 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 Yes. A uh, question for Josh and Danae. Uh, when you have to do so many shows in a week, whether you're on tour or in a performance like this, how do you keep each time feeling really fresh? Mm -hmm. I, I dance, and my dance coach is always trying to tell me. Every movement you do, it's only going to happen once, even if it's the same movement. So any advice for performers who do repetitive things? How do you make it feel really authentic and fresh each time? Well, half of, I think a good half of that is if the material is really great and true and good. Um, if you love it and you love the material that you're performing, so often, no matter what it is you're going through in your day that maybe feels monotonous, when that material hits you, hits you again, it just feel, continues to feel good. But also, just from a performance standpoint, because I'll do a concert, we just came off a concert tour where we wanted our 100th show to feel just like the first show, is I try to imagine that you know, there, there are going to be people out there um, who are hopefully going to be having the same experience I had when I saw my first show. And there's going to be people that are going to be seeing the show for the first time every night. There's going to be people who are maybe seeing a show period for the first time every night. And that's, I think, something that has always been really fun to know that, that even though you've done it a lot, you're telling that story to new people every single night. That's always been really exciting for me. That's always been something that's been, been really fun. Keeping it fresh body-wise, you try to do what you can to stay healthy. I'm fighting a cold. <laughs> Sang my butt off today. You know, I'm going to get a lot of sleep tonight. And you, you try to find ways to, to recharge. But, um, but I really think it is about it's about them, and it's about making sure that you, you get it to them every single night. Yeah. yeah, for me, it's probably two things. It's definitely the technique of it, like making sure for you the stretching, and for me, like warming up vocally and physically, like strategically and not skipping it, because I can, there were some times on tour I got lazy, and then the show reflected that I got lazy, and so you learn that lesson, because it's just you with the egg on your face. And um, 
on top of that, I think gratitude always gets me centered again with like the spiritual prep of remembering the girl in Florida who had no clue how to get here and challenging yourself to remind yourself of that for the night when you're like, oh my God, like I need to do laundry after this and reminding yourself to say a gratitude prayer and be thankful. And then that kind of, for me, always brings me back into the room. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, we have a ton of questions from social media, um, <laughs> but Rachel, I wanted to ask you a question just about balancing. You're like the most in-demand director in New York right now. I don't uh. know how many shows you had this year, but you had 80s Town and The Royale and Small Mouth Sounds, and you were in Edinburgh this summer, and now you're doing this. That's within like the last four months. Yeah. How do you... <laughs> <laughs> How, how is that even possible, and how do you like stay like 100% focused on five different things at the same time? Mm. Um, I guess I guess uh, um, I think I am wherever I am when I'm there, um, and uh, and so that being able to switch brain very very quickly, um, and I don't at this point I think. Yeah, at this point I don't work on anything that I don't feel strongly about. I have found that I will actually kill a project if I don't want to fully be there and trust it, even if it's nascent, even if it's still very much growing, um, if I don't have a profound belief in either the message of the show or the artist who I'm working with. And it helps that a lot of the projects that I'm working on now are with people who I have a history with. Um, so it's like coming home. Um, so, uh, uh, so it makes it very easy to be present with someone um, when you enjoy them. Um, but uh, yeah, I just have a really good segmenting brain. And I really thrive on lots of work. I don't like, I do really enjoy television when I watch it, but I'm pretty good at forgetting that aspect. So, um, so I, don't, I don't enjoy latency. I would say, and actually a big thing that I'm trying to work on in myself is trying to carve uh, space for daydreaming. <laughs> Great. Yeah. We're almost out of time, but I want to run through a couple more. Dave, somebody asks uh, what novels, what other novels lend themselves to musicalization, like what's on your radar? <laughs> well, so Rachel didn't mention, in addition to those four plays, we also did a, a workshop of Moby Dick. You're working on a musicalization of Moby Dick, right? Yeah. And I joke that, so this is part of my Impossible Novels trilogy, which will be uh, War and Peace, and then Moby Dick will be the next one, and then Ulysses. Right. That'll, be the, that'll be the final. All right. Yeah, and then we've talked, and we've talked, I'm a huge, I grew up on like sci-fi and mm -hmm. horror, so we've talked about Ray Bradbury. Yeah, Ray Bradbury, yeah. Sherwood Anderson. Oh, Sherwood right. Anderson. Yeah. yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much. So. I'll be calling you at four in the morning for a couple of days. Thank you. <laughs> Josh, I want to ask you about fandom because obviously you have this enormous and um, very active uh, group of fans. Uh, I, I couldn't, I obviously was doing too much Googling last night, but I typed your dog's <laughs> name into Google. Uh, oh Sweeney, okay. <laughs> there are All more right. than a thousand pictures of your dog on Pinterest. Yeah, it's true. I've got some of his artwork on yeah, my yeah, walls. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> my question is, so you've got this um, enormous fan base that is, accustomed to you doing a particular thing. And I wonder if that like, limits your artistic choices or how that informs like, what you do with your career when you've sort of trained a large group of people to expect a certain kind of art from you. It's a great question and observation. And I think that um, the fun part of having done this for now many years, there was a time in my career early on where I was um, kind of paranoid about not breaking through any of those boundaries. Um, it was coming at me from all sides, the, the pressure not to break out of any of those boundaries. What's marketable? Um, what is the brand of the record that you've made that we need to continue that brand you know, for the whole year? You know, don't uh, be too weird <laughs> was the worst one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, I think that as I've gotten older and as I've done more and as I've had less to prove, it's, and as I've gotten more opportunities from people that have um, allowed me to, to do stuff that maybe people didn't expect. Whenever someone like Jimmy Kimmel says, hey, I've got this zany idea for a sketch, it's going to surprise people, would you be interested in doing it? And it's 100% yes. Then that opens the door for someone else to say, hey, well, he's, yes, he's this, and he's also dot, dot, dot. And then it just kind of gets molded into your overall thing. So 
the wonderful thing about the um, the path that I've been able to pave really with my amazing fan base is that they're still with me because they too have enjoyed those things that have been molded on. Every time I've done something left of center or that wasn't me the first few years of my career, um, they've stuck with me, or at least the ones that are still with me have stuck with me. Um, and so there are 23 of them here tonight. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so that's the kind of relationship I want to have with my fans for the next 30 years, the next 40 years, is, uh, the ones that stick with me through the times where I might take myself and them to a place that we hadn't expected a few years prior. That's what keeps it fun. I think you don't want to ever get into a, uh, a routine, you know, with yourself artistically or with your fan base. And any fan that, that, that only wants the routine for your entire life, um, you kind of have to say to yourself, well, uh, maybe, maybe we'll find each other again somewhere down the road, but um, you, have, you have to feel the freedom, I think, to keep yourself scared, to keep yourself excited. And, um, and I'm very lucky, very fortunate that I've had a fan base that has been um, with me for those, for, those, uh, for those journeys too. So yeah, they're great. That's great. Um, so the Quiet show. Quiet you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the show is Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. This is Rachel Chefkin, Josh Groban, Janae Benton, and Dave Malloy. Thanks to them. Thanks to all of you and all of you online. Have a great night.